So my name is Marlene, and I teach in the Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Sciences Department. So this is going to be an outline of our, of our presentation. And uh, as Carl mentioned, we're all moms. I have a little girl who's two. And on most nights, we go on a walk around our block. And partway through, she'll usually sit down right on the sidewalk and say, Mom, I need a break. And so that's essentially what our, our um, objectives are today, is to talk first of all about pauses or intentional um, learning breaks that are meant to help reinforce learning and, and give students a chance to reflect and reinforce what they're learning, but also to highlight the powerful benefits of a faculty-based learning circle. And in our intro, uh, we explain what that was a little bit, but Rose is going to talk more about what that actually uh, was and, and, and entailed. But here's some starting definitions. A learning circle, at least here at USU, was just a community of faculty who were organized by ETE initially. And we met on a regular basis, like every month, every three weeks or so, to discuss ideas and research related to active learning and, and teaching strategies. And then as a group, we decided to read this book called Hitting Pause. And this book defines a pause as a designated lecture break um, with that's designed for periods of self-reflection and, and evaluation. So we're going to give some um, examples of some of those pauses later. But first, Rose is going to talk about uh, our learning circle and how that all came to be. Yeah, I'm Dr. Rose Judd Murray. I work for the College of Agriculture and Applied Sciences. I'm the non-formal and community-based education um, person. It's a new program there. So our learning circle last September, we met uh, as our first meeting. And like as, as Marlene said, we didn't really know anybody. We At last year's ETE conference, they had a little sign up there that said, who wants to learn about active learning? And we were like, we do. And then we all came together. And there's actually another person who's not with us today. Uh, but there were seven of us. We have various teaching roles from various different colleges. Eloise is a veterinarian and teaches ethics. And at the time, I was teaching science. And Marie teaches elementary education. And so we're kind of all over the place in terms of the size of the groups that we have and different things like that. But our learning circle, we decided to focus on active learning. And it just so happened that um, Travis Thurston came to us and said, you know, what about doing this um, pause um, book, reading this book? We've got this person coming to our session in the fall. And if you guys could give us some hands on about how this is going to work. So we just each broke it up as a chapter. We didn't know each other and we didn't know how this was going to work. But as we started presenting our chapters, and then we decided, well, this is pretty cool. This seems like a good idea. Why don't we're going to try some pauses now? And then the next time we met, people were like, I tried it, and it worked. And I tried this, and it totally bombed. And then the other six of us would be like, I hate it when you bomb, right? And so here's how we can make it better. Here's the cool part about learning circles. And I just, I'm just i kind of giving the plug for the ETE learning circles. Guys, out in that sunburst lounge, they're going to have probably Aaron or Jen or Amy, one of those folks there, and they're going to have a bunch of sign-up sheets. Get in a learning circle, because here's why. Collaboration, validation. I, I've, been to, I've been in this business 20 years now, and the most valuable thing I've ever done in professional development was with these ladies, what I did last year. And I, I don't say that lightly, because I've been to a lot of them in a lot of different states and some countries around the world. <laughs> and this was the most beneficial thing I've ever done. I did a little lit review because the learning circle was so effective. We're actually going to write an article and submit it to the ETE journal. So don't do that before we do, because we really need that publication. But I, um, in the lit review, task-based learning community, in contrast to a knowledge-based one, builds trust, openness, and I hate that word. You know what I mean. We're going to get back together. and We're going to learn from each other. And the truth is, is um, in true Utah speak, I'll just bear my testimony about this to you folks. This was as beneficial as it was for our students. And it was for us to co uh, pause at the beginning 
in the middle and at the end of class, it was just as beneficial for us to come back and say, what was really working in this pause? How did you modify this? When you had this with five students, here's how I need to modify it with 90. And to have that validation, to have that collaboration and openness, extremely beneficial. Thanks, Rose. Uh, my name is Denise Stewartson. I'm an Extension Associate Professor. Uh, my faculty appointment is in the College of Agriculture in the ASTE department. I teach a Brett Social Science course. It's a gen ed course. It's called Food Matters. And so I have 60 students in a, in a not a room like this, a uh, very traditional classroom. And so um, that's my experience. And, and I did what Rose said about the benefits of this. But I want to talk to you about the Hitting Pause book. This is the book that uh, Travis Thurston recommended that we use um, for our learning circle. And it is really, I mean, I have a, a lot of books and a, you know, a lot of, I read a lot, but this one is just like a handbook. It's like a how-to um, kind of resource. And I really, really appreciate it. It was written by Dr. Gail Taylor Rice. Um, she is a director of faculty development at Loma Linda University. And she makes the case for using pauses. So. She talks about the why. She talks about um, uh, the science behind that. So it's interesting, this book was really helpful for, as Rose said, both students and instructors, right? Students and instructors. So the students, I'm using these pauses, and my colleagues will share these um, examples of pauses in a few minutes. Um, but it did increase student uh, interest. It helped motivate them. In a class like, especially in a classroom like this, I don't know if I could teach in here. I'd have to work really, really hard because someone is going to be back there in the corner where I really can't see. And I walk and talk a lot. But these pauses are, are active. They're active pauses. The students are going to be doing something. And so you're going to help increase interest, uh, help motivate them to stay with you as you're presenting or talking or they're talking, and then help retain information. And I'll talk a little bit more about that also. But it also helps me as an instructor. Um, it's a really good tool for assessment of learning throughout your presentation, throughout your class, um, without doing quizzes. I'm just not a quiz person, and, and I've got 60 students. I know many of you have a lot more students than 60, like Jennifer, <laughs> but it's a great way to help assess learning. And so this book talks about starting pauses, mid-pauses, and closing pauses. And like I said, my colleagues will share some of those examples. So Dr. Rice talks about the brain science behind this. And she provides, it's really interesting, she provides um, research evidence from both cognitive science and educational psychology in doing this. And so I, I call it the five R's. Um, the book talks about refocusing, uh, reviewing information, and relieving cognitive load. You know, you're, you're going to, well, I don't know how you teach, but there's probably days when you present a lot of information to students, and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, they're just glassy-eyed as you talk for 15, 20, 30 minutes. And so it really helps them unload their thoughts, ask some questions, and refocus. And again, retrieving information and then re-energizing those. And research, I mean, this is, you know, you probably know this. Research shows that students take better notes as you get started. They're focused, you know, right? They can retain information from the beginning of a, a presentation or a workshop or a, a lecture. But as time goes on, you start to lose them. And the less you talk, and, and Dr. Rice said this when she was here presenting to us in March. She said, the less you talk, the more they're going to learn. Well, we don't want to hear that, right? We're the experts, so we don't want to hear that. But she said, the less you talk, the more they're going to learn. And they need a pause. They need a pause to reset. That's very, very important. So why pause? I, I talked about that just a little bit, about the five R's. Um, but it, she does say that um, these start, especially these starting pauses, Starting with a focused student is very important. Um, and making sure that, really, it's a payoff. I call it return on investment for our time. There's a high, for me, and I, I know these, these colleagues will support that, that there was a high return on investment for the time it took me to help instigate these pauses. And she talks about the fact that it really, it makes covering our content easier. It, even though it takes, it took me a lot of time to get these inserted into my um, presentations, but it is, more efficient in terms of class time, and it's very a very powerful way to use this. Students have a chance to process what they learn. They process what they learn, and she makes the case in, in one of the chapters here that these also, a closing pause helps close and wrap up, give some closure to the learning experience, which 
have you ever, I mean, how many of you are like, okay, time is up. But remember, we talked about this, and tomorrow we're going to talk about this. And, and you're closing up, they're shuffling the backpack with the hate. And so these closing pauses are very intentional so that you intentionally wrap up, re, uh, look at what they've learned um, before they walk out the door. And then the very last part of this book, um, really, really important. I love the, the book. More than half of the pages in this resource um, is, an, is an appendix of 65 examples of how you can instigate um, starting pauses, mid pauses, and closing pauses. Um, it provides, and I just took some notes, it provides practical guidance for creating um, active learning breaks. And so that's a, it's a how-to manual, basically. It includes descriptions of 65 different pauses with ways to apply those. And so it's an easy read, but a great handbook to use. My name is, is this on? Yes, okay, sorry. My name is Marie Lund, and I am a lecturer in the College of Education, and I teach elementary education, students who are going to be elementary education teachers. And the main class that I teach right now is cultural and linguistic diversity in schooling, which means that one of the main objectives of my course is for students to open their minds, think a little bit differently, embrace different perspectives, and recognize that there is a world outside of Utah, because the majority of my students are white, female, 21-year-old women who have grown up in Utah. That's the majority of who I teach. And so sometimes there are things that we discuss in my class, topics like white privilege or topics like um, LGBTQIA+, topics like um, multilingualism and those kinds of things. And we talk about these ideas. And I have students who are 21, year old, 21 years old, college students, juniors, tell me, I've never heard of white privilege before. So one of the things that we need to do in my class, one of my core objectives, is to have students open their minds up a little bit to the world outside of their traditional families that they've grown up here, predominantly members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And one of the ways that I do that is implementing a KWL chart. How many of you have used or heard of a KWL chart before? Probably a lot of us. Um, the K is for what I know, the W is what I want to know, the L is what I learned. And then I'll add letters onto the end of that sometimes. Maybe I'll add an R for reflect on what you have learned. Or maybe I'll add an H. How am I going to find this information? It wasn't all covered in the lecture or in the idea today. Sorry, I skipped. I did my second slide first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I love to do this because I want my students to articulate. I don't just want them to think about, I want them to really articulate and write down, what do you actually know about this topic? What do you actually know about traditional versus non-traditional families? What do you know about different social statuses? What do you know about um, socioeconomics? And the effect, the different things that your low socioeconomic students are bringing to the class versus your higher, more privileged students. And so I really want them to articulate what they know before we begin talking about it, before we read articles and research about it, before we share examples, because I want them to see where they started, and then I want them to see where they are now. That, oh, this class is teaching me something. This, my, the comments of my peers are helping me to understand and to know what exists outside of my head, outside of what I have seen on TV or something like that. And so I use this KWL to have my students do that, to show them, look what you've learned, look where you've come from, and then to pull in connections. Sometimes I throw a C onto it and I say, KWL, C, what connections have you made to the world, to this, to text that we have read in this class, to other courses that you're taking, because it's not just about what we're doing here, it's part of, this course is part of the whole elementary education degree. What connections are you seeing beyond the walls of our classroom, beyond the conversations we have here? And so I love to use this, and my students, when I utilize the KWL, when I have students articulate what they know, and then go back and reflect on where they are now, what they think now, 
then it shows them that they have progressed, they have learned, their perspectives have or have not opened up through the course of this class that I'm teaching, through the conversations that we're having. And if we back up to the previous slide, thank you. Another great starting pause is to start with a little quiz. And I love to do this using polleverywhere.com and there's also a Poll Everywhere app that you can have students use. It's free up to 40 responses. My classes typically don't get larger than 40 at a time. And so if you have a larger class, you could have students respond in groups or you could debate whether or not you want to pay for the use of that. But I love to do a word cloud with this. I'll ask students, what do you think of when you hear the name Christopher Columbus? And everybody throws words up and discovered America and Italian. Sometimes somebody says Spanish or French or something else. And what do you think of when you hear Christopher Columbus? And then we watch a short YouTube video clip about Native Americans' perspectives of Columbus, which are typically completely different from the white 21-year-old female that I have in my class. And then we come back and say, let's talk about this. What are the differences? Why did you feel this way? And these Native American groups felt that way. But when we throw these word clouds up, we have the opportunity for everyone to see what we think. And no one has to... No one has to raise their hand and share. Everyone gets to share at the same time. Distance education students reported that by using that poll everywhere, by using some of these starts, these pause throughout the class, that they felt more engaged and more connected to what we were doing on campus here at the Logan campus while they're out in Price or far, far away. All right. myself. Okay. Um, it's okay. So my name is Lacey Buschetto. Um, my current position right now is an instructor for the Applied Sciences, Technology, and Education Department as well. Um, I'm in Family Consumer Sciences Education. And I'm going to tell you about the mid-pauses. If you want to do my little slides for me. Okay, you're awesome. So the mid-pauses are kind of hard to implement because you're on a roll and you're doing your thing and you kind of lose track of time, especially I teach a large class, 50 minutes, um, it ranges anywhere from 120 to 130 students. So I want to get them, I want to get as much content as I can into them. So the mid pauses are, I think, probably the most important or the most challenging to me. So one of the, I'm going to share two of a, two with you. One is note sharing. So obviously every student kind of takes in a little bit different information and they analyze it a little bit differently and they write it down a little bit differently. So with note sharing, it gives them a chance to stop and you, Tell them beforehand, so when you begin the class, let them know so that they do take notes, because you know, some of them don't. Um, and then midway, wherever you want the pause to be, you have them stop, and you have them share their notes with somebody else. Um, so they can kind of see, did somebody else get something I didn't? Did they use an example, or did they put an analogy in their notes that is excellent and I would not have thought of? And so it helps them confirm what they know, and then you know figure out how other people kind of you know, looked at it the same way. So we could talk about these forever. So I can even make sure I hit all the talking points. You can do um, two to three people. So I had a, since I had a larger class, I had to do, actually I did kind of three to four, um, just kind of depending on your size, your class. So that's fine. And then if you want, at the very end, you can have them silently after they finish talking, come back to themselves, reread their stuff, and just reflect on what they knew what their fellow classmate kind of shared with them, and then they can kind of re-add in extra notes here or there, or just have some time to decompress a little bit. So the next pause I'm gonna share with you, which is a huge favorite of mine, especially in a large class, is fresh person. So fresh person is somewhat similar. They are sharing something out, except they're not sharing notes. Um, fresh person is in the middle of whatever you're lecturing on, you stop, and they need to actually sit for a minute, summarize what they've learned so far, and then they're going to go meet somebody new in the class. And in a small class, that might be really good, so you can kind of get like a really good intimate setting. In a large class, it's fantastic, so they don't feel lost in the sea of students. Um, and they get to just share. Here's my summary. Here's your summary. Again, it kind of compares um, how each student's kind of conceptualizing the information that you're giving them. But it also gives them a chance to connect with other students, to know that they are not alone. Um, 
some of your students are super chatty. Other students are, you know, very introvert-like. So the thing I like about um, the fresh person is it allows you to hear the conversation, hear the buzz a little bit more. Um, and if you want to go to the next one, with the large class that I teach, I kind of have it a rule that they have to go to the other quadrant of the classroom because it's a big auditorium where they sit. And that forces them to get up. And of course, you can always keep in mind or let them know that you're getting you know, blood back to your brain and they're getting a good break and taking a good stroll. I always tease my students because I do this a couple times that if there's somebody that you've been eyeing because it's Utah, they're kind of some of them are trying to get a degree in marriage. Um, so I kind of give them the initiative of, hey, if somebody's on the other side, go meet them. I'm like your dating network. But it, it happens. And then they move seats later on. It's kind of cute. I actually did this um, one pause when I interviewed for the assistant professor position for our department, which I got. But I got to finish this amazing thing called a PhD. A couple months. Anywho. Um, and I had, this is one of my activities within that, my observation class for my interview process. And I was impressed because my students actually went and interacted with the faculty that was sitting and observing me. I did not expect that to happen with this activity, but it did, and it was fantastic. Um, something I'm going to do this semester, which is a little bit different, just to kind of teach students how to network, because we as professionals know networking is huge. Um, they will have an index card, and every time that they communicate with another student, they will get their name their, you know, major or any little snippet of information so that when they leave, they're going to have a whole, a bigger index card, three by, or five by seven, but they're going to have a huge networking community that they can go to after this class or if they need help with something else. So, um, and I think that's it. So, it's a good one. I'm Eloisa Rutigliano. I teach, I'm an assistant professor in the animal science department. I teach in the vet school. Uh, I teach physiology, immunology, and like rules and ethics. So my courses are very diverse. Um, I teach first year vet students, and probably as some of you know, vet students are type, most of them are type A personalities. They are very focused on studying. They're very competitive. Uh, and we have a small class size. So we only have 30 students per class. Better? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, I chose, I tested some of the pauses. And actually, I tested the fresh person standing pause in my class. And it did not work. Because no one is fresh in a class of 30 people that are taking 20 credits together at the same time they take all the classes together. So, you know, I one recommendation I have is that you try a few pauses and see what works best for you because your scenario may be very different from your colleague's scenario. Another benefit of learning uh, circles because you can go back to your learning circle and say, I failed, they hated it, let's change it. So that's what we did. So there is one uh, pause. So I'm going to talk about closing pauses now. And one of the pauses that the book uh, recommends is this uh, YouTube or Twitter uh, video or Twitter post. So uh, you ask the students to make a video clip of uh, the summary of your lecture and post it on YouTube, post it on Canvas, whatever you prefer, uh, or keep it to themselves and share it to their, with their colleagues. Uh, another one is a Twitter post. So you ask the students to recall information, summarize information, and make a uh, Twitter post. Uh, in my case, I ask them just to post in the discussion board on Canvas. I don't use Twitter. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't even know how to tweet. So again, use what works for your class. Um, next one. Uh, another one is the four square feedback. So four square feedback um, is a pause where you ask the students to take a piece of paper, fold it twice, so we have four quadrants, and you ask them specific questions. And you don't have to ask those questions. I actually modify. Those questions are the questions that are recommended by the book, but I actually modify them, and I'll show them in a second. But you can ask them, what's the most important idea of today's lecture? What's the second most important idea? What's the third? How useful is this information to you? How to apply that information? 
Another one is the lecture wrapper. You can go back once. Yeah. The lecture wrapper is another one. Um, and the lecture wrapper, you ask the students to summarize your lecture without specific questions. So you can just eliminate those questions and just say, can you summarize the question, the lecture for me, and I'll give you one minute. So it's kind of similar to a one minute paper. So uh, how I modify the, the lecture wrapper. I tell my students in the beginning, beginning of class, I tell my students that they will have to create their own summary for their class. So in the beginning of the semester, I started giving them their summary. So I give class notes to them, and I summarize all that information at the end of class. But then I said, well, I'm going to have them summarize the, the information. So I deleted all the answers to that summary. I just had prompts to that summary. And I gave them a directed lecture wrapper or like a, a more directed one minute paper where I asked them questions that were related to a summary of the lecture, how they apply course material to a real life scenario, or how do they integrate course material. So depending on the lecture, I give them different questions. And I think that's Okay, so just some final thoughts. Um, I asked each member of our group to summarize the impact for them. And so Rose said this, participation in our learning circle last year was one of the best professional development experiences of my career. Not to mention by far the most enjoyable. Additionally, the incorporation of pauses, the development and practice of this technique has significantly changed the way I approach lecture type teaching. Lecture instruction has a role to play in university instruction, but it should be done with a consideration of how knowledge is acquired and retained by students. Without proper lecture instruction, lots of information is lost, and both the instructor and student do not benefit from their time spent together. Here's what uh, Denise had to say. This learning circle has provided information and motivation to re-energize my classroom teaching strategies using effective pauses. This, in turn, made my instruction more student-centered and provided opportunities for students to take more ownership of their learning. Uh, Marie said, I teach three hour long undergraduate courses. Incorporating these pauses has helped my students maintain engagement during class time without requiring additional breaks. Student feedback in my class showed that shifting gears and pausing to review, share, reflect, and report throughout class helps students to refocus their attention without feeling burned out during a long class period. Uh, Lacey said, this learning circle has allowed me to connect with and be inspired by colleagues that I may have otherwise not have crossed paths with, pass with. Pauses have increased the value of my courses by focusing on the student experience and by providing content transferability through reflection. Uh, Eloisa said, our learning circle has provided me with a safe environment to share my successes and failures as an instructor. It has been a source of informa information for me, inspiration for me, when I make changes to my courses. And then uh, my... my Paragraph was, for me, being part of this learning circle has been a game changer. It's given me new ideas and energy, encouraged me to try new things, and helped me become a more intentional teacher. But more than that, I now have a new tribe. Sometimes I call them my therapy group. But it's a community of friends that I can count on, collaborate with, collaborate with and go to when I need help, encouragement, advice, or added perspective. They are simply spectacular. So I hope you'll honestly consider learning circles and it doesn't even have to be a formal one set up by ete it could be within your um yeah your own department and uh anyway there's lots there's no right or wrong way to do it but uh we'll take questions for about five minutes does anyone have anything they want to say or mention So I find that um, if I give them like cues that I'm ending my lecture, it starts the packing up. Like Denise said, that's really annoying. So how do you keep with that closing, the closing pause, not having that become like this cue that, oh, class is over. I'm going to just you know, start packing up. So I make it very clear at the beginning of my class, I say, I mean, I introduced myself the first day of class. I said, my pet peeve is the backpack shuffle. That is so rude. You can see the clock. I know when we're supposed to end. 
and I va and I value that time that we have together. But I will end when class is over. So I just kind of set the stage for that because they look at the clock and go, oh, it's time to go. And I say, that is so rude to shuffle your backpack while I'm talking. And so I have to say it a couple times beginning of the semester. And so I and I don't and so I think that might just help. And so I would say, well, it's time to wrap up. That doesn't mean it's time to shuffle your backpack or close up and get your phone out and you know see who texted you while you were talking for the last 75 minutes. So I think you have to set the stage for that. And then knowing that you're going to use these closing pauses, I mean, does that make sense? I actually try to incorporate my closing pauses with an index card as much as possible, and then they have to turn that in for their participation points. So they, yeah, so it gives them some accountability. So and audience response systems too, uh, responses. So you record their participation. I give participation points. So I have some of my closing pauses uh, are through top hat or pull everywhere. So I keep track of who's in class and who's paying attention. This question is actually for you, Marie. Um, I was wondering for on the um, when you're using poll everywhere and you um, ask the the qu do quiz questions and then you do the word cloud. Does does poll everywhere create that word cloud? Yes, it does. It creates the word cloud as they do it. And if students have the app on their phone, they can respond through there. I just tell my students to text it in. It gives you a number that they can text. And so as students respond, it shows responses that have been entered multiple times are larger within the word cloud and responses that have been entered once or fewer times are smaller. And every time someone responds, it creates a new image. And so that is live for students to do. It has multiple choice questions. It has short answer questions. It has... Um, graphs so you could have a chart if I want to poll students how many of you are first generation college students versus not and then we can see but no one actually had to raise their hand so they don't have to identify themselves but within the website or within the app I can click on that as the professor and I can see who responded and who didn't and that's how I factor in participation in those does that answer your question yeah, fully thank you. okay This is for you as well. I think KWL, is that the right initials? <laughs> you said you had them do a table in their notes, right? Is, do they submit that in some way, or do you see them or uh, be able to get that feedback from them, or is it just for their personal benefit? Yes. Um, <laughs> so because there's a lot of reflection in the course itself, they go back to those, and they use those reflections or use those notes in papers and other written assignments that I have them do. Every once in a while, I'll have them submit that, take a screenshot of take a picture of it, or send it to me. I try to do as little hand me papers as possible because I know myself and I know what will happen with those papers and there's a 12% chance students will get them back from me. Um, and so I try to not have physical papers that I have to keep track of because I won't keep track of them very well. And so. I see them sometimes, but it's mostly for students to see what their thought process has been, how their opinions and views and perspectives has, have changed over the course of the semester. But at midterm and at the end of the semester, they have larger assignments that are 40% of their grade where they have to come back and tap into those reflections. And so it's mostly for their own personal reflection for them. But then I do, if they don't do that, they're going to be in a bad place at the end of the semester when they have to reflect and write an eight-page paper using those notes. 